So something that you might not know about me is in my 20s and early 30s, I traveled a lot. I spent my college and academic years, I used to be a teacher, I used to be a professor at Lipscomb University in Nashville, and I would spend my summers abroad. As soon as the year was over, I grabbed a backpack and I would go somewhere for an entire summer. My journeys uh, took me um, to over 20 countries, but in the last seven years I haven't left the North American continent. Most of that is due to me building a career here, and some of it's due to COVID, but this was my very first trip in about seven years that I've taken across the ocean. Technology has developed rapidly, and I would took great photos of trips to Africa and the Middle East, but I've decided since cameras are so good on the smartphone, I would start using video instead of photos and start telling my story. My career that I've built allows me to work from home so I can work remote. And my wife, Megan, has family that lives in Hawaii. She's been there numerous times. And with her full-time job and the 11-hour plane ride, she told me to just go ahead and have a good time. She and I are planning on going to Italy in the spring. And if that doesn't work because of COVID, we may be looking at Croatia and Greece. Since it's my first trip to Hawaii, I decided to just stay on the big island. Tourists like to go to Maui and Oahu, and I did have the option of skipping around on the islands, but I decided since this is my first time, I would just stay on the big island and really uh, soak up the experience there. Now, I decided to stay in Kalua Kona, and the reason that is is all the articles that I read said that if you were going to stay on the big island that's the place to go because a lot of the locals live there and you're not only in walking distance of the beach but also the farmers market the supermarket general stores pharmacies and that the downtown is really neat another reason is that's also where megan's family lives this was the hostel i stayed at i decided to stay there instead of hotels because when I would travel overseas, hostels was the place to go because most of the people staying there were traveling by themselves because they couldn't get friends and family to go and that was the only time that they could go and they weren't going to sit at home. They were actually going to go by themselves if they had to to see it and that's what I was like. You do pay different rates. You can have a dorm room where you share a room with numerous people like bunk beds. There's rooms for four and six and there's also private rooms. What makes the hostel appealing is also the common area at the bottom floor of the hostel. And that's where everybody comes and has breakfast together and dinner together and you get to know each other and little teams are formed where, hey, we're going to go to this part of the country, would you like to go? Or we're going to go to this national park, would you like to go? And people who are alone and traveling by themselves can band together and go on excursions together, especially with it being a foreign country where a lot of times people don't understand the local language or the culture or the layout of the country. Back in 2010, my best friend Randy, we went to the Middle East and we stopped in Italy on the way home. And at a hostel in Rome, Italy, there was a, two guys from Alabama and two girls that were school teachers in Northern California. We became really good friends and we toured Italy together. And to this day, 12 years later, we still stay in touch on social media. But that goes to show you the power of forming those relationships keeping in touch with those folks as the years pass. The two guys on the left were firefighters in Northern California and they were there to do some deep sea fishing. The next gentleman was from Corpus Christi, Texas and he was a criminal defense attorney. That's Tobias in the blue. Tobias was from Holland and he worked as a cybersecurity analyst. And he was a part of a forum that looked for airline softwares when they made mistakes. And he said out of 100 posts, two of them would be really good. And because there was a glitch in one of the airline system, he was able to travel round trip from Holland to Hawaii for $200. That's Ben standing up. Ben was a software developer at Adobe in San Jose, California. And he was able to give me some uh, behind the scenes info on Adobe Premiere, which is the video editing software I use, as well as Photoshop. That's Matt in the long sleeve gray. Matt was a physical therapist in Denver, Colorado, and he and two others were people that I traveled with a lot when I was in Hawaii. The guy with the beard, that's Bryce. He was a construction worker from Utah. The girl in the corner was a tattoo artist and she was an employee of the hostel. The girl with her knuckles to her nose, she was from Indiana and her family ran an RV park. That's Andy holding the paper. She was from Canada and she was an employee there as well. And that young woman was a PR and marketing agent out of Hollywood, California. This is downtown Kalua Kona. Uh, it was what you would think a tourist town would look like in Hawaii, but it was also filled with locals.
this was the farmer's market and you could get all kinds of different fruits and vegetables there. And one of the things I found interesting about uh, my experiences there, coffee was promoted everywhere you turned. But once you went to the north and the east side of the island, it was all about coconut. Coconut this and coconut that. And coffee wasn't mentioned at all. This was a local fruit called rambutan and it tasted very much like a grape. That's brass cutting a piece. Brass was from Singapore. And that's some papaya I bought at the farmer's market. What's Hawaii without some Hawaiian shirts? So these are my favorite Hawaiian shirts that I found and I pulled them out for the video. But just so you'll know, locals do not wear Hawaiian shirts. When you see someone in a Hawaiian shirt, you can safely assume that they are a tourist. Tobias from Holland, he and I went to the Kona Brewing Company. No matter where you go, stateside, if you go to Publix, Kroger, Walmart, you can find Kona Brewing Company beer. They started off as an independent beer and of course, one of the big boys bought them, I think is Budweiser. This one was my favorite, it was a brown ale. And imagine your favorite brown ale that also has a little hint of a taste of coconut. Me, Matt, the physical therapist, Sarah, and a girl named Deanna, who you'll meet in a moment, we went to a coffee bean farm for a tour. This tree was called a monkey pod tree and it was bigger than any oak tree I've seen in South Carolina or South Alabama. There you could taste the local coffee. They also made their own chocolate and you could buy some of that and then sit out on a bench and overlook this beautiful view. The avocado tree put out avocados that were bigger than softballs. And they also had a chain around the coconut tree for you not to get too close because coconuts have known to fall and kill people. One of the things I noticed about being in Hawaii is no matter where I went, I could always hear the birds singing. This is called a red crested cardinal. I'd never seen one before, but apparently they're native to South America. How in the world they ended up in Hawaii would be a story that I'd love to hear. And while looking through the trees, we spotted a local chameleon. The hibiscus flower is something you see on a lot of Hawaiian art and Hawaiian clothing. You see it in the patterns. And it made a lot more sense to me when I got to Hawaii because we saw the hibiscus flower everywhere. This is when Matt, Sarah, and Deanna and I went to the south part to see the Green Sands Beach as well as some cliff jumping. And you notice how different the terrain looks on the south side. That's Deanna, that's Matt, and that's Sarah. The rest of them are other tourists. This is the Green Sands Beach, and the reason that is, is there is a gem called Olivine. I hope I'm pronouncing that the right way. It's actually in the volcanic ash, but the ocean would come and wash away the volcanic ash, but the green dust from the gem would remain, and it made the beach look green. This group of people were from Cincinnati, Ohio, and Alaska, and they were cliff jumping. This is Sarah and Matt, and they decided to go for it. <laughs> we then went to the east side of the island, and it's on, it only takes two hours to drive across the island, but we wanted to see the volcanoes. Now, all of that was woods at one point, but a volcano erupted in the 1970s and 80s, and it looked like a bomb had went off. We did get to go at nighttime and see some lava oozing out of the volcano, but you couldn't see it that well at night. It certainly wasn't visible through video camera. And unfortunately for us, that was the only time that we could go. We couldn't go during the day. So seeing the lava oozing was not something I was able to capture on camera, but you can see much better footage online. Now this is Megan's family and her uncle Mark took me out deep sea fishing on my second day there. We didn't catch anything that day, but we did get to see what they called pilot whales, and it's a species of dolphin. Yeah. 
a dinner at a local restaurant with Mark and Denise. We had ahi tuna with some salmon mixed with tomato, seaweed, and rice. Now the next night I ate the leftovers and the purple looking vegetable was called poi, P-O-I, and it tasted like a very, very bland corn. But it was good, and according to the locals, it's more healthy than kale. The next day, I'm having some wine and food with these fun folks. Aloha. Mm -hmm. Ira is from uh, Boulder, Colorado, and Andy is from someplace in Canada. <laughs> Where Toronto. is it? Toronto. Mm -hmm. Ira had caught this fish called a unicorn fish, and he grilled it. I tried some, it was great. One of the things that he told me that I didn't know was when you go deep sea fishing, you'll catch some large fish and you think that you can eat them, but some of them are actually poisonous. And if you eat too much of them, you can die. So that was a good note for me as a foreigner, as a tourist, that if I ever did catch something in the deep sea and I was alone or with other tourists, I might want to run it by the locals and see if it's okay to eat. Me, Sarah, and Ben, the software developer, we went to the north because that's where a famous beach was as well as a waterfall. We stopped at a cafe and that main dish is fried pork but the soup was called tripe, and it was pig intestines. In Alabama and Georgia, we call that chitlins. Sarah had pork belly. I was going to order some lamb, but they said that they were out of lamb, so I settled for pancakes with this coconut glaze. These horses were wild, but with all of the food given to it from tourists, they were surviving just fine. Ben, were you horsing around? <laughs> We then stopped at this little fruit stand on the side of the road and had some coconut. It's different from what I was expecting, but it's good though. Game chickens were wild on the island and you saw them everywhere. They were as prevalent as pigeons. On my last night, you can't see them, but some folks from the hostel are behind me on a picnic table and we had a bottle of red and white wine and we drank wine and shared travel stories while the sun went down. I thought it was a very nice way to end my trip to Hawaii. I met some wonderful people on the trip and now I have memories that hopefully I'll never forget. Well, I hope you enjoyed that, and if you know anybody going to Hawaii, send them the video, and maybe they can find something useful.